I'm Pastor Brian Paulson, and this is The Message. Thank you for listening here in Libertyville, in Lake County, or all around the world. Center your heart now with the prayer for illumination, listen deeply to Holy Scripture, and get ready for God to deliver a word to you through the message by our associate pastor, the Reverend Amy Heinrich. Won't you pray with me? God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that, being taught by you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. Paul begins chapter 5 with these powerful words. Christ has set us free for freedom. Therefore, stand firm and don't submit to the bondage of slavery again. Let us listen to our text from the more modern translation in the message of two different understandings of what freedom means, which lead to two very different ways of living. Paul moves on quickly to define freedom in our world and in God's spirit. One is the more individualistic, self-indulgent, and entitled kind of freedom that our secular culture at times endorses, and the other is spirit-led, fruitful freedom bridled by love. My counsel is this, live freely, animated, and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with a free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are contrary to each other so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? It is obvious what kind of love develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, I, I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. This is the end of our first reading of scripture today. May God put this reading to our use. We pick up our reading right where we left off as we explore what Paul really meant by the freedom we have in Christ led by the Holy Spirit. It is not a wild, abstract freedom from restraint. Paul's freedom does not create the culture we have become, or at least not in his mind on purpose. Paul proclaims the freedom with the passive voice of having been chosen by an implied agent, God. To be chosen by God for freedom, to have been freed by Christ, is to have been freed from the dire results of a life lived apart from God. It is also a call into freedom that in some ways mirrors God's own. That is a freedom dedicated to serving others in love. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, 
able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. This is the end of our reading from Scripture today, the word of the Lord. On this Rally Day Sunday, we kick off our new theme for the year of Flourish with our preaching series on the different fruit of the Spirit's indwelling work in our lives. Each week we will focus on one of the manifestation of the Spirit's fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and I get self-control right after the election. Wish me luck. (laughs) But today, we will consider the whole garden of God, if you will, where we are free to dwell and flourish. Everything we need to live a fruitful, abundant life has already been planted inside us. The fruit of the Spirit is what God does in us because of who God is. It is interesting to note that the fruit of the Spirit is singular. It is fruit, not fruits. All the characteristics Paul refers to are an integral part of a whole. To explore the fruit of the Spirit is not to spur us on to strive for these attributes, but to awaken to the ways that Spirit tills the soil of our souls and what that healing, ripening, harvesting work produces. To engage with the fruit of the Spirit is to deepen our relationship with our source, the wild, untamed spirit of God, who brings to fruition a way of life that is both radically countercultural and at the same time our most profound sense of home. To awaken to spirit fruit is not to improve ourselves, but to become ourselves as we were created to be. We are a part of the garden of God, every bit as much as the creation that the spirit brooded over in Genesis. Our task is to yield ourselves to the interrooting, germinating, growing, weeding, pruning, ripening work. Our task is to tend the Spirit's garden by creating a receptive environment for the Spirit to cultivate fruit within us and through us. Once we taste the fruit of grace, we will recognize it (coughs) and hunger for it. I invite you to set aside the moral weight of the need to achieve the fruit in your own behavior with the attendant judgment, shame, and desire for control. Rather, just accept the gentle invitation to awaken and surrender. All you have to do is clear the ground, open your heart, your mind, your vision, 
let go and trust what the Spirit wants to produce through each of us. Here, the Spirit acts as a sort of midwife, helping us birth what wants to come to fruit and flower within us, our deepest desires, our most loving longings, our most authentic selves, and God's immense power and beauty within us. Paradoxically, the path to new life is death. This freedom to flourish in the fruit of the Spirit comes through many, many deaths along our journey. Our text says, among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting in our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified, death. Paul makes it so clear that there are two different ways of living and they are opposed to one another. One leads to flourishing life and the other leads to languishing death. One is living unto oneself with an ego as guide. And the other is living unto the spirit with love as the guide. We are called to the spiritual path of kenosis, the Greek word for self-emptying, as in dying to our ego-driven agendas just as we hear Christ did in the words in Philippians. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, a servant, by becoming like other humans. The way to fruitfulness is dying to this self-centeredness so that we can become a new person in Christ. The work of surrendering to our will so that thy will can be done is the very heart of humility. The word humility comes from the same Latin root as humus, as in earth. We must soften as fertile soil, malleable clay that creates the expansive, nimble conditions for the Spirit's tilling and sowing seeds of grace. We learn this by watching the natural world, how it composts the rotten fruit so as to create rich soil for something new to grow and produce good fruit. Paul gives us a long litany that Vicki read of the kinds of attitudes and behaviors that need to be composted, broken up, broken down, so as to break open with green shoots of new life. We hear Paul from the message say, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get our own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming and yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love and be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. We see a lot of this in our society, do we not? We are instructed as Christians to compost it, release it, repent of it, and let it be transformed as in turning over into rich new soil and just see what the Spirit can produce out of it. As with any ripening, it takes time. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. And just that the, as there are abundant seasons of harvest and bare seasons of waiting for new growth, so too 
in the seasons of our souls. There is a propitious time for every season, and it doesn't matter what season you are in presently, whether it be fruitfulness or fallowness. Our calling is the same, to faithfully tend, trust, and wait. Tending is not the same thing as thinking about or learning about. To tend, we must get our hands dirty. We must do the work. We must get into that garden, get acquainted with our inner landscape, all of it. The pests, the need for pruning and weeding, and the exquisite potential for growth. There will be weeds and wonder, the putrid smell of decaying compost, and the sweet fragrance of blossoms and ripe fruit. The garden is dynamic and alive, and life, just like in nature, comes out of death. In Paul's letter, he offers a number of gifts of the Spirit, such as prophecy, exhortation, tongues, wisdom, knowledge, Spiritual gifts are specific ways the Spirit chooses to work with us so that we can offer those gifts to the world. We do not choose them. They choose us for a particular purpose. The fruit of the Spirit is an entirely different concept altogether. Fruit is the product or the evidence of something. In Matthew 7, 15 to 20, there's a short story about discernment. Jesus says we will know the truth about people by the fruit their lives bear. Discernment is key. This begs the question of how do we discern if it actually is the Holy Spirit cultivating fruit in our lives? If the Spirit is the main agent for transformation in our lives, it behooves us to get to know just who this Spirit is and how she acts. That's right, she. In Genesis, the Spirit in Hebrew is feminine, ruach, which is also the same word for air, wind, breath, breeze, courage, or even temper. The Ruach hovers over the chaos of creation and sorts light from darkness, brings things into being at the right time, spins planets, and sets boundaries upon the chaos. This is an image of a fierce force for generative goodness. In Ezekiel 37, the Spirit hovers over the valley of the dry bones. There is nothing left but death. There is not even hope left in those dry bones. Yet the Spirit never gives up. The prophet says, I will put my Spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. The Spirit's very breath is the life force of all creation, shaking the ground on which we stand and calling forth abundant life out of arid, dusty despair, as dry as the dirt in a desert. Another understanding of spirit from Hebrew faith is Shekinah. Although this word doesn't actually appear in the Old Testament, rabbis in the Talmudic era referred to God's intimate presence and tender bond with God's people and God's world as Shekinah. I love this concept. It is a kind of mysterious light that surrounds people with God's presence, protection, and abiding love. In the New Testament, the spirit, or pneuma, as it is known in the Greek, is also known as wind or breath. 
And in the story of Pentecost, the spirit is not only wind, but an empowering fire that enables us to speak and witness across barriers and boundaries. In Jesus' farewell to his disciples in John, he promises his friends that he will ask the Father to send the Spirit to help them when he's gone. He describes the Spirit as an advocate or helper or encourager. In Greek, parakleton, Spirit as advocate adheres to the truth and provides a defense on behalf of people. Now, who wouldn't love to have a divine defense attorney? The connotation of Paracletan as helper is similar to the notion of Shekinah, the reassurance that we are never alone. Jesus even says you will not be left orphaned, suggesting that the Spirit will adopt us and accompany us always. This reminds me of the Celtic prayers of God's blessings that surround us, God who is before us, behind us, above us, beneath us. When I'm going through a particularly difficult time in my own life, I envisioning the Shekinah. I envision an all-encompassing light, like a bubble of protection around me, like a shield or Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. Jesus also tells his disciples in John that there's a new spirit of truth coming. Al Aletheia refers to the big truth embedded in every heart. The spirit of truth opens our eyes to our own blind spots and is an anti-arrogance serum. The spirit of truth not only opens our eyes, but opens our lives to a more joyous and vivacious way of living with wonder, generosity, and gratitude. The spirit will teach us and remind us of what is true, we constantly fall into forgetfulness about whose we are. When we try to sever our tie with our source, the Spirit reawakens us and retethers us to our interconnectedness, not only with God, but all of creation. When Jesus makes a post-resurrection appearance, he literally breathes on his disciples and says, may peace be with you, receive the Holy Spirit. The indwelling binds together spiritual and physical in our human lives. Wow, what would we do without the Holy Spirit? I think it's the most underestimated part of the Trinity. The older I get, the more I am like, I'm right there with you, Holy Spirit. The Spirit is a superpower that shapes, shifts, and imbues all of life with shimmering potential. The Spirit never dominates, threatens, or coerces. Rather, the Spirit hovers in circles, creates, dances, liberates, empowers, ignites, comforts, guides, reminds, encourages, intercedes, helps, and holds us always in that Shekinah holy hug. How do we recognize the Spirit's nudging, conjoling, fierce fire, or mighty wind in our lives? First, let me suggest that the Spirit is not merely transactional, but transformational. The Spirit doesn't mess around with simply rearranging deck chairs on a ship, but wants to blow the ship in an entirely new direction. Second, the Spirit often surprises us with what we may want to dismiss as mere coincidence, or some might call it synchronicity. 
But when you stop and think about it, no one could orchestrate the grace-filled unfolding or intersection of relationships and events at just the right time, but the force of a hidden yet holy guiding hand. Could this be the Spirit? Third, third way to discern the Spirit in your life is to look for an unexpected sense of homecoming the peace that passes all understanding. The Spirit may blow us into uncharted waters to fulfill our mission like Jonah crossing the sea, to fulfill God's command, to share God's love with the enemy in Nineveh. However, the Spirit will always, like Shekinah, lighthouse, beckon us back home into the safe harbors of grace again transformation, surprise, homecoming. God is the vine and we are the branches. Cut off from God, we can do nothing. After all, could any of us really on our own will and way fully embody the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control without being tethered to that wild and wondrous midwifery of the Holy Spirit? Have thy way, Spirit, have thine own way. You are the gardener, we are the clay. Till us and sow us while we are still to fruit and flourish after thy will. Amen. Thank you for listening on our podcast or through our YouTube playlist of sermons. Be sure to forward this message to someone whom you believe is seeking God's word today.